but I think right from the beginning, the entire experience, I really did look at it as when I was training my martial arts. There were times where you sit there and you say, am I going to make it through this? Hey there, everyone. It's episode 44 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sifu Angel Dernick. I'm Whistlekick's founder, Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm also your host here for Martial Arts Radio. And here at Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear and some great apparel and accessories, every bit of it for traditional martial artists. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank all of you returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we offer, like our lightweight sparring gloves. Softer foam and extra reinforcement means they're more comfortable to wear, but still last much longer than the competition. We put a bunch of ventilation on the back, too, to cut down on the sweat buildup. You can learn more about our sparring gloves and all of our other gear and apparel at whistlekick.com. All of our past show episodes, all the show notes, and a lot more are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're on our website, why don't you sign up for our newsletter? We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests. Now, on to today's episode. On episode 44, we're joined by Sifu Angel Dernick. Sifu Dernick is, like most of our guests, a lifelong martial artist. She's trained in a number of styles and was well-known on the New England competition scene for many years. But that's not why we brought her on. Sifu Dernick has dealt with some significant personal challenges over a fairly short period of time. Despite that, she's kept her chin up and faces every day with grace and a positive attitude. She shares her stories openly and graciously, which made my job really easy. So with that, Sifu Dernick, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. Oh, I'm excited to have you. This is, this is going to be a lot of fun. So why don't you jump into it? Why don't you tell us how you got it started in the martial arts and when and where and all that other good stuff people like asking? Um, well, actually, I started a little bit later in life than I think some people who've been training all their life have. I started at the age of 12. Um, I saw, it's kind of a funny story, I saw the Power Rangers on TV and I was like, that looks easy, I can do that. <laughs> it's not easy, but I said, hey, I definitely want to give that a try. So um talked to my parents and um, my mom was definitely a little hesitant, not too thrilled about me wanting to do martial arts. And my dad said, hey, let, let her try it. She'll probably stop after a couple months anyway. And here we are over 20 years later. And... <laughs> I'm still involved in martial arts. That's great. And it's it's funny that, you, you know, age 12 seems to be late in life for martial arts, isn't it? Right. You know, so many of us start, I mean, I started when I was four, and I'm certainly not an anomaly in starting so early. But starting at 12 is certainly the vast majority of your life, and of course, the part that counts. Right, right. The part where you're all developmental and everything. So what styles or what style did you start in and what did you like about it that kept you going until now? Um, the style that I started in actually was traditional Weichiru karate um, with um, Master Grandmaster Art Rabisa on the cape. And um, getting into that, it was very traditional. Um, there was a lot of um, technique and such that was really enforced there. There was no tricks. There was no um, any type of backflips. Everything was very straight edge. Um, you learn your basic forms, some chin, um, doing such like that. And I just, I really loved it. I was the only girl in the class. Um, I used to absolutely love training with the boys. Um, I didn't shy away at all. I loved sparring with them. I loved learning forms. I loved learning the right way to punch. Um, I loved my instructor. He was absolutely fantastic. I had several other instructors that I really loved too. Um, Master Tony West and Master um, Bill Botnick. And they were just absolutely amazing role models and amazing at what they did. Um, and from that point, I just, I knew I was hooked right from the beginning. I, I knew I was going to be in martial arts forever. Even though you weren't learning how to be a Power Ranger. No, even though I wasn't learning how to be a Power <laughs> Ranger. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I started in Michiru and then down the road I started, um, which is a very hard style actually. And then kind of funny, I got out of the hard style and did um, Kung Fu, which is a soft style. Um, so completely opposite. But um, it was really nice because they focus on different things like weapons, um, doing more 
different types of soft style forms, which I really loved. And it was really flashy. And I really enjoyed going out and doing some of the flashy stuff. It's fun to do. It just looks different. It looks really hard and it looks really um, unique compared to what, you know, traditional hard stylists look like out there on the floor. And you don't see that every day um, as some of the Taekwondo competitors and such like that. Cool. Yeah. And so what did you like about I mean, you mentioned some of the, some of the contrast there, but I'm guessing that there was some synergy there for you. There was something about not just one versus the other, but one with the other mm-hmm. that you kind of pulled in. I mean, most people that I talk to that have trained in a number of arts have, they start drawing connections between the two. Did you do any of that? Oh, yeah. Um, I think when you're in really good um, schools, no matter what style you're in, there's a lot of um, things that are similar. The um, the respect aspect and trying to develop the students into learning about themselves and pushing themselves. Um, I think all sports teaches that to some extent, but I know martial arts really builds off of that. Um, You're really taught right from the beginning to um, push yourself past what you think that your limits are and how to be a leader and how to motivate others and how to make healthy choices all those things, regardless of the style that you do, I think is really built into the traditions of martial arts. And I really love that, that having the traditions and um, being able to um, use several different styles together and taking the strengths of each one and, and being a better martial artist because of it. Yeah, I, I do too. Those are all, all absolutely wonderful things. And of course, here at Martial Arts Radio, we're big on stories. I mean, that's that's what we do. We tell stories. So I want to give you the opportunity now to tell us your best, now that we know a bit about who you are, your best martial arts story. Oh, gosh. Um, I have so many stories. I have so many stories. Um, I think one of my favorite ones, actually, was when I was really young and I first started and I was in Weichiru. Um, and as I had said before, my mom was kind of hesitant on me doing martial arts. Initially, I think she was afraid I was going to get hurt and all those things. My dad said, let her, let her sign up. I'm telling you, she'll stop in a few months. She'll be fine. And, um, I was sparring and just by a freak accident, I had broken my collarbone and, um, you know, 12 year old breaking their collarbone in the sport, you think they're pretty much done. And I cried my eyes out and it was because. I wanted to keep training and I had to not train. And I think at that point, my parents realized, Oh, we're in for it. She's not quitting anytime soon. (laughs) Now, what was their response to seeing that dedication? I think they were really proud of me. I think any parent would be proud of their child, but they really saw how it helped me develop into the woman that I am today. They, They really respected the fact that I worked so hard and that I would get up early in the morning and I would train. Eventually, you know, I would get up, I would train, go to school, um, get out of school, come home, do my homework. That was always a priority. I had to have good grades. If I didn't have good grades, I wasn't going to be training or competing in martial arts at all. Um, And then I would go and I would train and I would teach until sometimes 9, 10 o'clock at night and then get up and do it all over again. And they really were proud of that dedication that I gave to the sport. I think any teenager that's waking up before school to do anything. Right. I mean, sometimes, I don't know if you remember, I I remember as a teenager, a good number of my friends not even showering before school. Right. Barely, you know, making it out the door with an apple and their books. Right. But here you are getting up training. I mean, that that shows a level of dedication and certainly passion for the martial arts. It's a kind of abnormal for kids that age. Right. I, I'm not a morning person. I never have been. But I remember there were times, even on weekends, if I, there wasn't a tournament, which was rare, I would have private lessons. And sometimes they were at five in the morning or six in the morning, depending on what time the instructor could get there. And I'd have one eye open, but it was just, it was part of it. It's what you had to do. If you really loved what you were doing. And it, you really wanted to move on and be the best that you could be. You just, you didn't have a choice. You had to do what you had to do. And I don't regret one second of that. That's fantastic. And, and yeah, learn, learning that you're not a morning person makes it even more impressive, <laughs> for sure. So you started, even if you're going to call it later than most, you still started pretty early in life. So it's hard for us to probably imagine what, who you would be without martial arts. But I'd like you to try. Imagine 
what your life might look like, and where do you think you would be today if you would never step foot in that dojo? Oh, wow. Um, it's you know, martial arts has really molded me into who I am to the point where I really it's hard for me to even imagine where I would be without martial arts. Um, my parents, from the time I was really little, um, really demanded for me to do the best that I could. You know, I didn't have to be a winner all the time. I could make mistakes, but um, they tried to instill hard work and dedication and all those things um, in me from a really early age. And so I think that I would still have some of those skills. However, when you do something that becomes such a part of you, like martial arts, I think some people train and then they become whatever rank they're going to be. And they look at it as it's a hobby. Um, for me, it wasn't a hobby that it truly, it, it made me into a different person. So I really couldn't even tell you where I would be right now. I probably wouldn't be as successful or as strong of a person as I am now. Um, some of the experiences that I've had in my life have been, you know, ups and downs. I've had some wonderful experiences. I've met some wonderful people and I've had some really hard times in my life, um, even recently. And I don't think that I would be as strong or as advanced. Um, with who I am and where I am without it, period. Fair enough. So you mentioned highs and lows, and our next question is about the lows. Mm -hmm. Tell us about a point in your life that, you know, maybe wasn't quite as rosy as the rest of it Oof. and how your martial arts training and experience helped you move through it. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, I got two for you, actually. Um, one was a couple years ago. Um, I've been married now for 12 years and, um, my husband and I had wanted children and we, um, were expecting twin sons. And of course I already had little geese picked out for them. I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. And, um, a little bit more than halfway through my pregnancy, I ended up, um, losing both my sons. And, um, they were alive for a couple hours and we had, you know, some wonderful, time with them but um there is nothing harder in life i don't think than any parent bearing their children it's just not normal it's not something that you plan on doing it's not something that you ever think is even a possibility in your life um so to experience that was really really hard and um you have to go through mourning obviously everyone handles things differently but i think right from the beginning the entire experience i really did look at it as when I was training in my martial, martial arts, um, there are times where you sit there and you say, am I going to make it through this? Is this my limit? Have I reached my limit in my life right now? How am I going to see tomorrow? How am I going to push myself that step further? And when you think that you've hit your limit, there's so much more that you can do and so much further that you can go. And that's really what helped get me through that is remembering my training and remembering, you know, the tests that you were on or your black belt tests. You know, everyone I think remembers their black belt tests in a time where you're like, this is it. This is how it ends for me. <laughs> I'm done. I don't know if I can go on any further, but you have to trust the people that you care about around you and that love you and know, and, and your instructors included. They know your limits and they're going to push you beyond them. And that just makes you a stronger person in the long run. So that was certainly one experience. Um, recently this summer, actually, I, um, being that I was in martial arts most of my life, I um, have the normal aches and pains. You know how that is. You get out of bed and you're like, oh, I need to do some stretching a little bit. And oh, my arm, my knee. Um, and my arm was bothering me. And I thought to myself, geez, I wonder... If I, you know, finally ripped my rotator cuff, you know, it could have been anything. So I go to the doctor and, you know, they do some tests and I get told, hey, um, just so that you know, we found a brain tumor. So I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> are, you, are you sure? You must have the wrong patient. There's no way. I, th this cannot be happening to me. And they said, no, you know, that we found a brain tumor. We think it's non-cancerous, but you need to see a specialist. So um, I went to um, one of the hospitals in Boston because we have some of the best hospitals in the world. And um, 
ended up having to have a 10 hour surgery to remove a donut sized brain tumor on the back of my brain, a meningioma. Yeah. And, um, that was quite a wake up call to me. Um, I wouldn't wish it upon anyone. It really makes you sit and look at life and say, Hmm, okay, what else do I still need to do in my life? What haven't I finished? What haven't I accomplished? What have I put on the back burner? Um, but doing, going through the, the brain surgery, I really, really depended on my martial arts a lot. Um, I had friends who I competed with that came down and they're like brothers and sisters to me and they came to visit, visit me and spend time with me. Um, I was so determined when I went in for the surgery, after the 10 hour surgery, I looked out of the ICU. I was in the neuro ICU and the nurse um, asked me what I needed. And I saw my doctor talking to some of the nurses out in the hallway. And I looked at her and I said, you need to unhook me and I need to walk. And she was like, are you kidding me? You just came out of a 10 hour brain surgery a couple hours earlier. Like, take, you just take a load off. Don't you know, rest. And I said, no, my doctor needs to see me walk. I want to get out of here. So she did. She unhooked me from everything and I walked and I walked past my doctor and he just, the look on his face was priceless, just priceless. And, um, I was determined. They, they told me you have to walk three times a day. I walked eight. I was out of bed. I was moving around. Um, they expected to keep me. I had my surgery on a Friday. They wanted to keep me until Wednesday. I went home Monday morning. Wow. So there's no way I could have done that without my discipline. Um, and my determination from the martial arts, that truly is what got me through. And I know that um, there's there's no way that I would have had the intestinal fortitude to dig down the way that I did after that brain surgery and push myself to get back to where I was so quickly. There's just there's no way. So here I am almost exactly four months after my brain surgery and people look at me and they can't even tell that I had brain surgery. So four months, I mean, that's, mm-hmm. that's nothing. Right. You know, I mean, usually when someone listens to someone talk about a surgery that they've had of this magnitude, it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, we're reflecting back, but here we are almost still in it. Mm-hmm. I mean, ten, 10 years from now, we'll look back at this time and say, you know, it had just happened. So tell us about what your life, just a little bit about what your life is like and how you're continuing to recover um, from that. Well, I was, I was so fortunate and I never take for granted at all um, my recovery. I um, did not need physical therapy. My physicians were absolutely amazing. Um, I came home. There was a lot of forcing myself to rest. I'm one of those people that even after brain surgery, after three hours of sitting around, would be like, okay, what can I do? Can I clean the house? Can I start working on writing my book? Can I, like, what can I do? And um, that was really a learning experience for me and to be a little kinder on myself. So I really, on an everyday basis, was forcing myself to just be me and recover. And now I'm starting to get to the point where I can start to slowly go back to putting on my running sneakers and go for a run if I want and do those things and start to hopefully train again soon and get back into um, the dojo and really start to go back to the sport that I love so much that helped get me through it because it's just, it's, something that is missing from my life and not having the opportunity to go and do that has been really hard. So I really have been doing a lot of resting um, and just little things, you know, stretching here or there, trying to just get back into shape again, because it was, it's going to be a while before I'm a hundred percent again. Sure. Sure. I mean, of course, something that huge, it's going to take time, but how long was it after you went home that you did your first thing that you might term as martial arts, you know, throwing a kick or a punch or anything. Oh, geez. Um, I have visions of you, you know, sneaking, doing martial arts when no one's looking. (laughs) And I'm wondering if that's true. Right. Um, Honestly, I mean, some blocks and some moves and stuff like that, just just to move around, like getting really stiff and sore and tired, I would say about three months out, just being able to move around, being able to see if I have 
you know, the coordination still. I think coordination was so huge for me as I was so afraid that I was going to lose all that. I mean, martial arts is so huge for coordination. And I was afraid, you know, brain surgery. Am I going to be able to have that hand-eye coordination that I used to have? Am I going to be able to do that? And as I would always kind of play around a little bit, like, okay, you know, can I, if something's coming at me, can I still block that or, or something like that? And once I finally saw that I'm okay and I'm still me and I didn't lose that, I relaxed a little bit. So. Good. That's great. And so what, how long do you think it'll be until you're back training in the dojo? Oh, I wish it was yesterday. Um, <laughs> <Of course. laughs> I wish it was yesterday. I wish it was tomorrow. Um, I, the goal is I want to get through the holidays. Um, I want to get through the holidays still really feel um, strong and a hundred percent. I don't want to walk in too soon and then take a step backwards. So um, I'm hoping that after the first of the year, um, it's a February timeframe. I'm going to head up towards um, Vermont and train with um, uh, master Houston Alexander, who um, I grew up with for years and years and, and do some training with him and try to come out of retirement a little bit, get back to the martial arts, circuit a little bit and see how I do. I think more fun this time rather than hardcore competing. Well, that's great. And of course, anyone who's listened to the show uh, for a while knows that Master Alexander was the first episode. <laughs> uh, good friend of, you know, both Whistlekick and, and me personally. He's, he's, a, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And of course, he and I go back, you know, as long as probably you and he go back. Mm -hmm. you know, all came up together. So, that's a wonderful story, an intense story, and um, I'm probably not the only one listening to this that was getting a little bit emotional. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing that piece and, and being so open about it. Oh, no, definitely. I, I've learned through the years that um, if you have something that happens to you, if you can motivate at least one person to not give up and push themselves, I think we oftentimes get caught in the you know, this is only happening to me or I'm having a hard time. And if you can motivate people that, hey, you're going to get through it, just like that martial arts test that you've had, you're going to finish, you're going to look back on it and go, wow, that was rough, but I did it. That's that's huge. That's what it's about. Absolutely. And such a wonderful attitude to use that experience in, to, you might almost say, inspire others to keep plugging along. And I, I'm certainly taking it that way. I'm, I'm feeling very, uh, you know, yes, emotional, but also, you know, really motivated and, and just having some kind of personal stuff fl float into my head right now and saying, yeah, you can, you can get past that. Right. Absolutely. You've got that. Right. So let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. And you talked about some of your instructors, but who would you say has been the most influential in your martial arts upbringing? Ooh most influential yikes um i have so many instructors that were influential in so many different ways um when i was younger and i was in wechiru um master tony west was a female instructor that i had and she was so amazing and she was just the way she carried herself was so amazing and so strong and she was so confident I knew right then I was like that's the type of woman martial arts I want to be I want to be just like her um mm -hmm. then as times went on I mean I had so many instructors that were so good to me and so wonderful um even in kung fu um that I had Glenn Broadley um Super Glenn Broadley Super Rick Long who um backed our organization out of Boston who was fantastic but um, even down the road, I had trained um, in sparring and fighting with Master Grandmaster Ed Budd, um, and he took me under his wing for a long time and really helped build me into the martial artist that I am today. I, he really dedicated a lot of time and energy into making sure I could be the best that I could be, and he was so inspirational. Um, <laughs> I mean, he's great. He's great. I, I can't. There were so many great people, but he has a special place in my heart for sure. As you're talking about these different styles that you've trained in, it really seems pretty well rounded. Mm -hmm. You know, and I just that that's something that's striking me as I'm hearing you talk about that. And uh, of course, I know several of those names and absolutely wonderful martial artists and how 
awesome it is that you've gotten to train with all of them. I think that's fantastic. Oh, it's amazing. I, the people that I've had the opportunity to meet um, when I was competing and, and training full time is just unbelievable. I, I would never trade it for anything in the world because I, they've just, they're such amazing people um, and they're not going to be here forever. So just the idea of the fact that I got that opportunity to train with them before they retired or before they, you know, moved on to other things is just, outstanding to me. Absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, you, you bring up that it's you, it was your connection with these folks through competition mm -hmm. that happened. And when I hear people talk about competition, it, I'd say that's one of the aspects that's often left out. We talk about encouraging people to compete, to test themselves and to help themselves get better, to experience it, to learn how to perform under pressure and all these other things. But one of the things that I think isn't really discussed is that as a community, as a wider martial arts community, it's really only through attending competitions that you get to meet so many people and some of these absolutely wonderful people that you might not even know who they are because they train in a different style. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I mean, you meet so many different people who do train in so many different styles, but I think when you're around enough that you meet, you meet your judges, you meet people that are there and what, you know, people that become your friends that are part of other schools, you meet their instructors. But through the years, I've just, some of the people that I've met have been so fantastic. Um, Grandmaster Pete Porter out of Vermont. Um, he's been fantastic. He's a great, great martial artist. Um, Master Wayne Mello, he's fantastic. I, I could go through a whole list of so many people that I've met that truly are the icon of what real martial arts is. And it's so nice to see that because there are so many um, other sports and other even martial arts schools and stuff that people are, are in it just for the money. And these people aren't. They're in it to build students and to um, really build people into being the best that they can be. And that's if you can find an instructor like that, stay with them. Stay with them forever. Don't ever leave them. They're hard to find. Really thank your instructor because they really are doing more for you than you can ever imagine. I totally agree. It's um, Shion Mello was on the show at, at one point. I forget what, what interview number he was, but uh, an amazing man. And uh, I attended college in Worcester, Mass, mm -hmm. in part so I could train with him. Wow. So. Yeah, I just I, I have the utmost respect for him, just as you do. So mm -hmm. awesome. So that's a little bit about the competition side, but tell us about your time competing. And you know, now you're talking about coming back to competition, and how do you see that going differently? <laughs> yeah, um, when I was competing, I, I I loved competing. That was my life, and I was on several teams. I was on um, Team Zeon for a while. I was on Team Viper. Um, I had my own team for a little while. Um, I also competed as an independent for a while. I, I had a sponsorship with Reebok, which paid for some of the um, the tournament entry fees and, and the traveling and such like that. And I was very, very fortunate for that. I, I was very blessed to have that um, opportunity um, with Reebok. And I ended up going out and competing mostly in broadswords sometimes. Um, I did staff in weapons, but mostly broadsword. That was my weapon of choice to compete with. Um, I also um, competed in um, forms, and I absolutely loved competing in open hand forms. Um, I did a lot of um, traditional wushu um, and also um, sparring. I did like sparring a lot, but it's just, I'm a showman. Um, so I really love going out and, and doing forms and, and competing. And the few, the very few times that they would combine the men's and the women's um, divisions was for me, at the best, I loved that. Absolutely loved it. Uh, yeah, I, you, you and me both. It's the, as you put it, the showmanship is the piece that I love the most. Not that sparring is not fun and a blast to watch. I think I probably enjoy watching it more than I do participating in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, I loved it. I was, um, I was ranked number one, um, in each division at one point or another when I was competing, um, and it. It was great, and it was a challenge for myself. Every year, I always challenge myself um, to try to get a little better, to do something slightly different, or um, to just view things 
a little differently out on the tournament circuit. Um, eventually, I actually did um, have my own tournament on the ePwn circuit. I um, had started the um, New England Classic um, uh-huh. at Franklin Pierce College. Um, I started that that for a few years, and then when I stepped away for a while, I had um, handed that over to um, Elizabeth Kenny, um, and she's done an amazing, amazing job um, taking over that tournament. It's it's amazing. It's, it's awesome. I highly suggest you go and and check it out if you haven't been. Um, but I loved that. And Epon was basically, um, what I competed in the most. I did do some NASCA and Crane and I loved doing that too. That really challenged me, um, going out and competing with some of the best in the world that competed, you know, all over the world all the time. That was a real test. If you really wanted to kind of see how far you've come, you go and you kind of just go out there and lay it all on the line, do something new, maybe do musical form, something like that. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, at this point in time, I think if I go back, um, one thing at a time, I am a showman. So we'll see. I say that I just want to go out and have a good time and I won't compete, but once it's in your blood, it's always in your blood. And I think we'll see. We'll see. We'll see what I, didn't, I didn't want to accuse you of anything, but I had a feeling. I had a feeling. And and I hope when you do compete, it's one of the events that will be set up at. And I hope I get to see that. So yes, that, that'd absolutely. Be a lot of fun. That'd be great. And, and I'm sure it would be a big deal for anyone there that knows you. So, um, And of course, after listening to this episode, you'll have to keep everyone, keep us informed so we can let everybody know when that's going to happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. You'll hear about it. You'll hear about it, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So... We talked before about who you had trained with. Let's talk about who you haven't trained with. Who would you want to spend some time getting better with? Oh, gosh. Um, living or dead. We'll open it up even more. Living or dead. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I guess I kind of have to say the classic being, a, you know, a Kung Fu practitioner, a Bruce Lee. I mean, who wouldn't want to train with Bruce Lee? Um I really on my bucket list has been um, I need to get to a seminar and train with Bill Superfoot Wallace. I haven't gotten there yet, um, but I, that, that's definitely on my list. He, he left me a message one day um, for my birthday and he's just such a jolly, um, nice guy and just every, how can you not want to train with him? So I definitely want that experience. Um, yeah. And oh gosh, you all, there's so many people. I mean, you can pick up so many different things from so many different people. I, there's a huge list, but I think those two are right on the top of my list. Two great ones for, for sure. And um, Bill Wallace is a great guy. And for, for listeners that might not know our back catalog of interviews, uh, we did have him on the show and we were fortunate enough to put on a seminar with him back in August of this year. And it was it was just fun. It was just a ton of fun. Everybody there had a blast, and he had a blast. And that's the best thing is to watch someone that loves what they're doing, teaching other people that love learning what they're doing. And that's right. you know just to to be part of that was absolutely fantastic. That's that's the epitome of a martial artist. It's just loving what they're doing and sharing it with others that love what they're doing as well. That's a great summation of what a martial artist is. Mm-hmm. Couldn't say it better. <laughs> So how about movies? You a big martial arts film fan? Um, somewhat. I think sometimes when I get into watching a movie, then it's like, right, let's go train. Um, <laughs> or, or I'm looking at it going, that's not right. Or maybe, maybe that should have been done instead. But um, I, I have been known to enjoy a few movies. I love um, let's see, some classics like Bloodsport. Um, that's just, you know, classic. Um, I really loved Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. I think the new one is coming out this summer possibly i heard it it is i don't know that there's a release date beyond 2016 but oh. it's going to hit netflix the same day it hits theaters oh wow so, no, that's which is a big deal yeah no that was a great movie um i love the jackie chan movies like rush hour you know they humor but he's just he he's amazing at what he does you just look at him and you're in awe at how great he is some of the best choreography i've, I've ever seen so so creative right right with the choreography Right. Or even when he did um, Legend of Drunken Master, you know, the Drunken Kung Fu, that's just such a hard, hard, hard style to master. And you have to really um, 
I have a knack for that. And he just makes it look so easy and beautiful. Yeah, for sure. Is he your favorite martial arts actor? Um, yeah, I would say all around martial arts actor, I would say probably Jackie Chan. I would say Jet Li too. I mean, just really solid, strong Kung Fu that, how can you just not love them? They're just, to me, it's just the epitome. They were so huge when I was growing up in the sport and really what I looked at and said, oh, so that's what that's supposed to look like. I'm going to try to look like Jackie Chan. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I'm not going to look like Jackie Chan, but I'm going to try to look like Jackie Chan. Um, so yeah, I would say, I would say he would probably be my favorite. Yeah. He's, he's, if he's not my favorite, he's definitely up there. And of course, Jet Li too. Mm -hmm. Just two absolutely tremendous martial artists first, but then martial arts actor second so they have a ton of my respect right are you a reader any martial arts books you'd recommend um not really to be honest i don't read a ton of martial arts books um there are a couple that i've flipped through you know some of the bruce lee books um such like that i do have a story about a book that i received though from someone i am um, when i went to college I actually had an oral communications instructor and she had done um, a couple years over in China and she did some Tai Chi and stuff like that. And she had had picked up, and I don't remember who the author was, but it was a traditional broadsword book. Um, mm -hmm. And she had brought it back and she had had it for years and it was on her bookshelf and she had um, heard that I competed. And I think she saw a video of me somewhere online or something like that. And she brought it in and she goes, you have to have this. Like, it was like, I brought it back from China to, to give to you. So that oh, was cool. really special. So I think that more than, than just sitting down and cracking open a book, that was something that was really special to me. That's wonderful. Yeah. that That's really cool. So how about goals? I mean, we, we've already talked about some of them and getting back to training, getting back to competing, but I know that those are going to happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I have no doubt. And I'm sure anybody listening has no doubt because you have no doubt. Right. But if we look out a little bit further, if we look out, you know, five, 10, 20 years, mm -hmm. what martial arts goals do you have? Oh, honestly, um, I sat before I had my, my brain surgery. I sat and I, I made like my own little bucket list and I put it together and I said, I want to come out of retirement. And I want to train and all those things. But um, I would really love, to pick another couple styles to get, you know, really well versed in something different that I've never done. I'd love to do a grappling style because that I haven't done. Um, and a lot of fights go to the ground. Um, but I think that would be really interesting for me. So I would absolutely love that. Um, I would love to get um, more acquainted, you know, if, when, if I start training with, um, um, Master Alexander, I'd like to just get a little bit stronger in my traditional Taekwondo, um, do more traditional, um, competing, I think, rather than, you know, the flashy, um, get, I want to go back into a hard style, I think, more than a soft style. Um, I do miss that. I think 20 years down the road, I'd like to have another couple of black belts. Um, I'd like to have a book written. I'm actually writing a book right now. Um, that I plan on having out, hopefully, I said January, but I'm thinking it's going to be close to February. Um, and it's going to be kind of a motivational autobiography about what I went through with the brain tumor and such like that, but also how martial arts really helped build me into um, the person that I was to get through those tests in my life. So um, keep an eye open for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I can't promise how many we can help you sell, but I can speak for one. At least one for me. So yeah, oh, thank you. That's yeah. awesome. Please, please keep us in the loop on that. Yeah. That's exciting. We've, um, I think we've had a couple authors on, but but we haven't had anybody pre-author. Right. So right, it's fun. tough. It's it's interesting to sit down and and just write and put it all on paper. But it's something I've been wanting to for a while, and it now is the time. Now is definitely the time. So I'm excited. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So you've been through a lot, and I'm sure that you've got a ton of advice for people listening, but let's let's boil it down. What would you suggest for advice and words of wisdom for the people that are listening to this? Oh, gosh. Um, martial artists out there, I would say, I've got a lot of it, I guess, but um, always surround yourself with people who push you to make yourself a better person. 
Um, and that's in everyday life, not just martial artists. I mean, you want someone who's going to um, support you regardless of where you're at in your life, but you want to surround yourself with people who are going to hold you accountable for who you are and what your goals are and um, help build you up. Um, so definitely surround yourself with great people. Um, that's really important. And also to keep pushing yourself. You can train for years and learn how to punch and kick um, and do all those things. But if you don't develop as a human being and open yourself up to what the traditional martial arts teaches you um, on the inside, I think you're missing out a lot on what the martial arts is. Um, it's not just about earning a black belt. It's not just about, you know, earning the title of Sifu or master or sensei. It's about the people that you can change and make better than you've become. Um, really passing on the tradition of the art to people below you so that the art continues to be strong. That's, that's huge. And that's what I would tell everybody who's training. Wonderful advice. And if people want to get a hold of you or learn more about you or follow you and know that they're going to know the moment that book's available, <laughs> how could they do that? How could they do that? Um, I'm on Facebook. Um, being that, you know, I am married now. I use my um, married name. It's Angel Jarnett Cummings. Um, so, yes, I am on Facebook. Um, you'll see me on the tournament circuit. Um, so I'm sure if people um, see me next year around, please come up and say hi. Um, I'd be happy to update everyone on where I am with my book and, and all those great things. Um, so I think that's your best bet. I mean, I'll be, I'll be out and about next year. I've been saying that a couple of times and then some really crazy things have happened. So I'm going to knock on some wood, but right now the, the plan is next year. It, it's time. I'm ready. I feel good. I'm motivated. Let's do it. Awesome. And I'm, and I'm pumped for you and I'm excited to see you on the circuit and, and we'll, we'll be, putting out whatever we can to keep people up to date on what you've got going on. So that's going to be a lot of fun. And I just want to thank you for coming on and, and sharing all that with us. It was some pretty heavy stuff and you're really open about it. And that means a lot to me. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. It's an honor. Um, thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to episode 44 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. And thank you to Sifu Dernick. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to everything we talked about today. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the form on the website. And don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter so you can stay up on everything we do. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out in the future. And if we could trouble you to leave us a kind review on whatever platform you download your podcasts, we'd really appreciate it. Remember, if we read your review on the air, just contact us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to follow us on social media, we're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. Remember the great stuff we make at Whistlekick, like our awesome sparring gloves, and those are over at Whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.